right, so um, we're going to continue today <coughs> with these uh, non-parametric tests. And the idea is, for all these non-parametric tests that we're doing, they're testing the ranks uh, rather than the actual values. So they're translating all the numbers that you have uh, into just rankings, into integers between 1 and n. However many n is however many numbers you have total. So um, th because the advantages, again, that because when we do that, we basically have a uniform distribution, just numbers between, uh, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to how many numbers you have. That's a completely uniform distribution. So that it translates very easily, very quickly into our standard normal distributions. When you look at the average or the sum, we're looking at the sums of these ranks. It's very quickly, uh, because of the central limit theorem, you can use the normal distribution when you have very small sample sizes. So that's the idea. And um, you just have to evaluate yourself whether you think that ranking makes sense or doesn't make sense. Whether you want those actual values of the numbers or you want the ranks, because you lose all the values themselves when you do this. You're just ordering them. You're just, and that sometimes is what, exactly what you want. So that's the idea. And um, we said that it also has another, in many, many instances, it's actually, uh, when you're testing the null, it's a stronger null. It's not only a strong point of this last test, the Wilcoxon man whitney rank sum. That's where we're comparing two distributions. Um, a strong point is that it compares the whole distribution and not simply the means or medians. So um, this means that two distributions could have the same mean or median, but the, uh, this ranking test, the wilcoxon man whitney test, would still reject the null because the null is stronger. Not only that it has the same averages, but basically like with the example that we did when we looked at whether two exams, uh, two versions of the final were uh, equivalent or not, we were interested in whether they were the same difficulty level for all students. So even if the means were the same, we wanted to go further than that. We didn't want it to be, we wanted to look at uh, whether the, all the percentiles matched up, basically. So that was, but, um, but the Will Cox and Man Whitney test, okay, so look at the distributions below. Okay, so in both cases, the two groups have the same mean, like here's a mean of zero and here's a mean of zero. And this one, you also have a mean of zero and here the numbers are negative five and two and three. So those five and negative five, those also will have a mean of zero. All right, now this one, these are asymmetric around the mean. This one is asymmetric around the mean, the mean's right here. Okay, and um, here, they're symmetric around the mean. Okay, that's symmetric around the mean. So, um, and they both, in both cases, they have the same mean. I should write equal to zero, so you can see that, equal to zero. But they have different distributions. This is more spread out. They're both more spread out. Now, would this test, would the Wilcox and Man Whitney test, detect the difference in distributions in both cases. Now remember when we use a Z or T test, it just detects the difference in means. It doesn't, you know, we're not trying to detect differences in distributions. All right, so now we want to know, will it in both cases? And that's what we're going to explore. Um, so let's try it. Um, so when it's symmetric around the mean, so let's just do the test. We can do it either by converting these numbers to ranks numbers one through six, or do you counts? We can start with the ranks. And the ranks are going to be what? The first, the lowest number was, is right here. That's one. You remember, you put all six numbers together. It's going to be integers one through six. The second lowest is here, two. Now, these are both um, zeros. So you'd think they'd be, so they take up the spot three and four, so we're going to give them both ranks of what? 3.5 and 3.5. And then what comes next? Not four, but five, because there's six numbers, right? These both take, whoops, these both take, here we have one, two, 
and these are both 3 and 4, 3.5 each. Now the next one's 5 and 6, all right? So this one's five, 1 is 5 and 2 is 6. Does that make sense? You can imagine just laying this on top of here, and you could see you'd have 1, 2, both would be tied for positions 3 and 4, this would be 5 and 6. All right, so now we just, to get the ranks, we just add these together and see what we get. So 2 plus, so we get 10.5 here, 7 plus 3 point. And what do we get here? 10.5. So it doesn't detect any difference. It ranks them the same exact way. It can't, it says these distributions are the same. So, so when it's symmetric around the mean, no, it does not detect the differences. We can go further um, and do the U counts as well. If we were going to do it by a U count, how would we we'd look at this? Remember what we'd do. We'd say, okay, so how many, this is negative 1, how many does it outscore over here? It outscores just 1. Then you can move on to 0. How many does that outscore? It outscores this one, and it's tied for that. So that would be 1, and what would it be? And we'd get a half a point for being tied. And this next one, 1, um, beats negative 2, and it meets, beats 0. So this would get 2. And we'd add them up, and we get 4.5. Let's see if we get the same thing here. So if we do this, negative 2 is low. It doesn't it surpass any of these scores. So it just contributes 0 points to the team. 0 uh, outscores negative 1 and ties here, so that's 1.5, and then 2 outscores all 3, so that's 3, and we add these together and we get 4.5. Sorry, this is kind of, so that's what I'm doing, the U counts. So these are the same. These two are the same, and these two are the same. So it doesn't work here. By the way, if you wanted to check that we didn't make a careless mistake, what should we check here? we would check that what? These two added together that are, you know, you could check. Let's do a check for each of these to make sure we didn't make a mistake. So we'd check that 10.5 plus 10.5 has to equal what? Does it equal? Um, you'd have to add together the numbers 1 through 6. So that would be, there's six numbers times you can think of it as the average of the numbers 1 through 6. It would be n plus 1, 7 over 2. So remember that? The average of the numbers 1 through 6 will be 7 divided by 2. So and there's six of them. It's n times n plus 1 over 2. That's what we're checking from last time. And yes, it does. That's 21 equals 21. So it does check. Now for the u, what would be the check? For the u, it would be, um, does 4.5 plus 4.5 equal, would you remember what you do? The number three, there's three numbers here and three there, and so each one of these three is compared to these three, right? So there's three times three pairwise comparisons, and yes, it does check. So they check in both cases. So that's what, this is just, um, so it doesn't work. So it doesn't work in all cases, what I told you. So in a case where you're symmetric around the mean, um, the, this test will not detect the difference in distributions. But now how about when it's asymmetric around the mean, like here? Um, will it detect, they both, here again, we both have means of zeros. So the other tests wouldn't detect it, but does, our, does the rank test do? to detect. The Z and T test wouldn't detect it because they have the same means, but would the rank sum? So let's, and the U count, so let's do the same thing. So now we can do these, and um, actually it's easier to even picture this, because you imagine put them all in one distribution. These three would sit right in the middle here. So you can see right away as a U count, each one of these would only beat one of them, right? So the U count would be very easy. All these, negative 1 would only beat negative 5, 0. You know, you can just think, they all only beat that. So it would be 1 plus 1 plus 1 
equals 3. Whereas if you put them all, you can see right away, as a U count, negative 5 doesn't outscore anybody. But these two, both of these, outscore all of those, all three of them. So 2 is higher than all of those, so it gets a U score of 3. And 3 beats everybody on that team. So that gets a U score of 3. And here we have 6 versus 3. And we could do our check is 3 plus 6. 3 plus 6. Is that equal to 3 times 3? Yes. So we knew we did it right. Now the ranks are pretty easy too. We could do those. The right, these three are put right in the middle here. So they're going to get ranks what? This is rank 1. This will have rank 1. These three are 2, 3, and 4. So you have ranks 2, 3, and 4. And these have ranks what? Five and six. One, five, and six. So we add these together and we get uh, nine. And we add these together and we get 12. And we check again does nine plus 12 equal, does it equal six, because there's six numbers, times the average of the, these numbers, one through six. The average of the three numbers, you just say, there's six of them times the average of them. n times n plus 1 over 2. And that is 21. Yes. It's 21, so it's, yes, it does. Same thing. All right, but in this case, now we've got different statistics. We've got different statistics, so it does detect a difference. So it does detect, it can detect the difference here. So the takeaway is that um, basically, they can, that this can only, when you have the same mean, the, this rank sum test, um, we can write this down, um, when means, same with medians, it's the same, are the same, when means are the same between the two distri distributions, The Wilcox and Mann Whitney test can only detect differences in distributions, only de can only detect differences in distributions where one of them is asymmetric around the mean. You can just see that right here. All right, so that's just, um, so it's, it's not that it, it can't always detect. But usually, I mean, it, it usually, so you have to think about, uh, you have to look at the distributions of your actual data, is what I'm saying. Any questions on that? So when the mean or medians are the same in the two distributions, this rank sum test can only detect differences in distributions that are asymmetric around the mean, where if, if one of them is asymmetric around the mean. So uh, all I'm saying is it's really important to look at your data. You can't just assume it's going to detect differences in distributions. All right, so now um, we are going to uh, extend this, this, remember this is the equivalent of the two sample Z test. If we look at the back of the, if we look at our little table at, on page um, 207, these are the three we're going to do. We just did one, this basically compares two groups on a quantitative measure. Now what if we have three or more groups on some quantitative measure? Instead of doing ANOVA, that's what we usually do, we can do this, called the Kruskal-Wallace test. All right, and um, it's the, 
it's the non-parametric equivalent of ANOVA, whereas the one we just did was the non-parametric equivalent of the two-sample t-test, all right, or z-test. So now let's move on, and then we can do this one too. We can finish everything today. We'll do, we'll do both of these, and um, we'll do the Spearman rank order correlation coefficient, which is the non-parametric equivalent to the uh, our standard correlation coefficient. We're just going to change everything to ranks. So we'll get through everything today, and this will be the last lecture over uh, the course content. And, from, and then the next two lectures, we can just have review for the final. So you'll have a lot of review for the cumulative final. And all your, uh, your homework's now posted on both sections. I put it into one homework, so this is your last homework that's due tomorrow. And then I'll give you a lot of practice homeworks to do that are also up there. So you can have practice for the final and practice homework that will be graded itself. All right, so let's just get on with it. So here we are at the Kruskal Wallace test. And it's the, uh, you, it's when you have, you're comparing the means of three or more groups to see if any of them are different. Okay, so an ex it's an extension of what we just did, the rank sum. The, the WMW, the Wilcox and Man Whitney, to three or more groups. So it's going to be very easy. It's just very much like what we just did. It's the non-parametric version of ANOVA for comparing group means. And again, these all have the, these non-parametric tests have the uh, advantage of, of not needing the assumption of the underlying normal populations. All right, because we change them to populations that are uniform which very quickly, our statistics on them, the sum or the average, quickly becomes normal, very quickly. So that's why we don't have to worry about what the, popu the underlying population looks like. All right, it starts off exactly like what we just did with the WMW test. And, um, and here's how it works for three groups. So you combine all the three groups into one order list. That's just what we did with the two groups, from smallest to largest. And you assign each value a rank from 1 to n, where n is, you know, the number, the sample size with each group, inside each group, the total number of observations in all three groups. And if there are ties, you give them the average rank. So um, now, here's our test statistic can't be a z, because we can't boil down the difference between three groups into a single signed number. So whenever we're comparing more than two groups, you cannot use a z-test because you can't, you have to, how can you do that? You don't have a single number. You have to look at, you have to um, look at the whole pattern of differences. So you have to square the differences and then um, do a basically chi-square test on them. We're not going to do an f-test because we're going to, as I said, we, we know, we're going to know the standard deviations once we change them to ranks. So we're not going to need to do an F-test. We're, we're going to do, uh, basically, we'll have the sum of z squareds, which is a chi-squared test. All right, so let's say we have three forms of the final randomly distributed to 16 students. And actually, in your final, there will be three forms or more. In set 100, we had nine forms. So we want to see if they're all equivalent. OK, let's say we want to see three forms are equivalent. So. Um, were all three, the three versions of the final equally different for all types of students? And the null is, yes, they are. And he, that's what we, in this case, we don't want to reject the null. It's unusual. We want to show that the null's true. But here are the scores, okay? And again, group A, because it has this 10 here, is going to be, if we actually did our ANOVA, this would just automatically make whichever group this clueless slacker student who got a 10 on the final, that's almost impossible. Even if you randomly guess, you have to guess, guess poorly, cheat off the wrong version or something. This is really, really a low score. And so just like give up or don't even put it on. Nobody gets in. Listen. So that means that that student, no matter which group he, was randomly, he or she was randomly assigned to, is going to show, is going to give a significant F stat, if we use the F statistic, if we use de novo, it would just show that group that exam is different when it's not. So we, in this case, for sure want to change to rankings because we don't want to give that student so much weight. 
And that often happens when people take it early. They just say, oh, I just wasn't prepared. I just Okay. So here, so we're going to give them rankings. So let's put them into rankings. And I, it's kind of, just because there's three of them, you don't have to do this step. But I just combined and ordered them into one list with rankings 1 to 16. And note, if two are tied, you give them the average ranking. Okay. So now, um, we have two ties. We had a tie right there. All right, so let's do it. We can just look down here then. 10 is 1. 60 is 4. We're just going to add all these up. 70 is 5.5. 80 is 8, and 100 is 16. So we add all those up, and I got 34.5. So that's the observed rank sum for group A. And now we can do it for all the groups, too. So 50, you have 3. 70 is 5.5. 81 is 9. 85 is 10. And 95 is 13. And I added those up, and I got 40.5. And now we just do the last one. 2 plus 7 plus 11 plus 12. 98. OK. And I got 61. So those are my rank sums. All right, so these are the observed rank sums. That's what we call these. These are the observed, what we observed in our sample. And now, what would we expect under the null? Under the null, we would expect them all to be the same and all to be what? Well, um, we compute the expected sum for each group. The expected sum for each group is very similar to the expected sum for all of them. Let's just make sure, first we should check that we didn't make a careless mistake. The expected sum is, if you think about it this way, this is the average of the 16 numbers. So that's 17 over 2, that part, which is 8.5. So on the average, you'd expect each and this is just the sample size. So that's 16 times 17 over 2. And we get 136. And just check. So you want to check. You know, does 34.5 plus 40.5 plus 61 equal 136? And it does. Now, we're using the same reasoning here. This, again, is the average of all this is the 17 point over 2, the 8.5. And then this is just the uh, sample size. So the sample size for each group. So there's five numbers here. And you would expect on the average that each one of these fives would average. You know, If they're all equal, you'd expect the lows and the highs to average out. And you'd have five times the average of that group. I mean, five times the average of the middle number is 8.5. So you'd expect, on the average, each one of the five to be 8.5. Some are lower, some are higher, but they'd average out. So it's this group, the sample size is 5. This also has a sample size of 5. And this has a sample size of 6. So that's how we can figure out, um, maybe I should write this down. So n, where n sub i is equal to the Sample size, the size of group I. And capital N is the total number of observations. All, all the groups combined. Combining all three groups. And then N plus 1 over 2 is just the average of the numbers or the mean of the numbers of uh, mean of what? Numbers 1, 2, 3, blah, 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 all the way up to n. It's going to be right in the middle. If you started at 0, it would just be n over 2, right? If you started at But now you start at 1, so it's n plus 1 over 2. That's the mean of those numbers. So 
Now, the expected value of the rank sum of A is 5 times, what did I do? I said 5 the sample size times n plus 1, which is 17 over 2. That's 8.5. And that's how I got that one, right? That's 42.5. All right. This one's going to be the same. This will also be 5 times 17 over 2, which is 42.5, because they have the same size sample. But this one has more numbers. So when you, it has one, so it's going to be 6 times 17 over 2. And that is 51. So these are what are called, this is the observed rank sums. These are the expected rank sums. And we're going to look at this chi-square st statistic, which is going to be, you have to, um, the sum of the observed minus the expected, you have to square it, otherwise it'll sum to zero. You'll see that when we do it out. Over, and this in the denominator is really what you're probably used to if you've had a previous stat course when you're doing a chi-square test is the observed minus the expected squared over the expected. But the expected, it's really an expected variance. So if you did a little bit of arithmetic and just put this back in the denominator, you would have that statistic that we had before. The you see the 12? You'd have, um, you know, n1 times n times n plus 1 over 12, and if it took the square root, that would be very similar to our standard error formula that I told you about before. And by the way, if you're interested in where that 12 came from, we'll probably get out early today. I can just show you after class, and I'm going to post a little uh, explanation of that. So let's look at this. Um, first off, this is distributed as this. This is what, so this is, will be given to you. This right here, you do not have to worry. Watch. This is how your final is going to look. It's right here. So this is the other formula. This is that 12 I was talking about. So if you actually, this right here, you know, if you put it in the denominator, it's going to have the 12 in the denominator. You'll have n times n plus 1 times this. So you have those three n's. It's, a li it's very similar. And, um, but it's squared. That's why you don't have the square root. Remember, chi-squared is like the ratio of two variances. All right? Or, th oh, the sum of z, z squared. So you have to have squares. It's, it's going to be a variance in the denominator. All right, so this is, this is going to be given to you, so you don't have to worry about these two. So right here are the nonparametrics. These three are going to be, you'll learn this in a minute. These are the non from nonparametrics. And this right here are the two that you've had on, uh, your, final, on your other exams. You had the stand, these two. So those are your formulas, what the first page will look like. So you don't have to memorize these. All right, now, what you do need to know is the degrees of freedom here. The degrees of freedom for a chi-square is always the same. It's what? The degrees of freedom for all the chi-squares is what? It's the number of groups minus 1, right? The number of parameters minus 1, the number of groups minus 1, same thing. So this is going to be the number of groups minus 1, which is equal to, in this case, we have three groups, so there's two degrees of freedom. That you do need to know. This is given to you. So now it's really, let's work it out and see, and then you'll understand it better. If we work it out with these numbers, I, examples always help me understand things. So let's work it out. So we're going to do this. So H is equal to 12 over 16 times 17. And now we have the sum from i is equal to 1 to g for the three groups. We're going to get the observed minus the expected squared over the sample size here after we factor that out. So we'll have, let's do it for each one. So the first one, first group, we have 34.5. Minus 42.5, right? And then we square that, and then it's over 5. And now the next one will be the difference between 40, what we observed and what we expected. 40.5 minus 42.5 squared over 5 again, because there's 5 in the group. And then our last one will be 61 minus 51. 
squared over 6. Okay, now just um, when you look at this, it makes sense. Remember, the bigger this is going to be distributed as a chi squared, the bigger this statistic is, the more likely are we are to reject the null. And that makes sense because the bigger our differences are from what we'd expect when the null is true, the null is that the groups are all the same, that the finals are no different. The three, they're all equal difficulty, which is what you hope when I write different versions, right? You hope they're all equal difficulty. And so um, these differences just are going to, there's going to be some difference just by the luck of the draw, but you don't want them, the bigger these are, and it does, you know, the positive and negatives are going to cancel out, so we have to square them. The bigger the squared differences are, the bigger our H stat is going to be, and the more likely it is that they'll be, uh, we'll reject the null, which says they're all the same. So uh, let's do this. So we have 12. Let me just show you what you can check, too. So if we look at all these, we have 34.5 minus 42.5. So that's negative 8 squared over 5. That's that difference. What's the next difference? 40.5 minus 42, that's negative 2 squared over 5. And our last difference is 61 minus 51, 10 squared over 6. Now, but if we didn't square, this is why we always are squaring these differences, if we didn't, they'd always sum to zero, and that's a good way to check you didn't make a mistake, because if they don't, you did something wrong. Negative 8 plus negative 2 is negative 10 plus 10 is zero. That's why we have to square them. If we didn't, you just always get zero. You could take the absolute value, but that's a different statistic, and it's not as robust. Sometimes that's done. But we want to get rid of those signs. And that's what we always do with all the, uh, these differences. These, that's basically the idea of the standard deviation, is that you square those differences from the mean. OK, so we do this. And when I did it, I got 1.344. All right, so that's our H statistic. And we're going to compare that to a chi-square distribution is what we're going to be looking at. This is going to be distributed. You can probably see this is the sum of z scores, because this is the observed minus the expected. And the denominator here is basically the standard error squared. So this is the sum of three z scores. And there, we're using a chi squared. And, um, and remember, our degrees of freedom is two, so we'd expect a chi-square of about 2 when the null's true. And we got one even less than that. So this is, first we should look on a chi-square table with degrees of freedom 2 and find our critical value. We know it's shaped like this with degrees of freedom 2. You can, I remember we've done it so much that the critical value at alpha equals 0 0.05 is, is 5.99. We've done that one a lot, but let's look. So you'll get this table, and here you have two degrees of freedom. And we have, I mean, the p-value is, we have this, um, look, ours is just, we, it's, it's wonderful for me because I wanted it to be very similar. This would be great news for me because it, this is, it's obviously we're going to, we cannot reject the null, because our statistic is right here. And at, this is like at 5.99. This is the critical value of chi-squared. Um, with 5% this way, that's what it means. At alpha equals 0 0.05, it means that 5% is to the right. So that's 5% there. And if we wanted to reject the null, so when the null is true, and we do this, and we compute a chi-squared, if we assume the null is true, the chance that we'd get an H stat which, um, of 1.344, that must be way down here, 1.344. We could uh, figure out the exact p-value 
if you had on the computer, I did, and I got 51%. So ours is like somewhere around here, where 51% is that way. That's our p-value. That's where 1.34 is. And the mean is about 2. Okay? So it said, okay, here's our test stat. So this is our test stat, and our p is approximately 51%. And the only reason I know that is by looking it up online. Do you want to do that together or not? We don't need to, do we? Is everybody good? All right. So um, obviously we need to get our p-value, our h stat is less than 5.99, is less than the critical value of chi-squared at alpha equals 0 0.05. What is it? Ours is 1.34. And it's less than 5.99. So, what did it? Say? So we cannot reject the null. In other words, in other words, if the null was true, if they really were the same difficulty, they were the same exam. The same exact exam. And I randomly, there was no difference at all. It was the same exact exam. And I randomly distributed it to groups of five, five, and six. The probability that I would get in uh, 1.34, or even more extreme, is 51%. In other words, the majority of the time I would get this when the null is true. So this is good news. This is very good news for me because I want them to be the same. Does that make sense? All right. So you can write, because this was important, it means if the null was true, that the exams were all, basically it was the same exam. If the null was true, and I randomly distributed the same exam among 16 people in, in three groups of size 5, 5, and 6, if the null were true, was true, I'd see as extreme, remember you're supposed to get 42, I'd see as ex this small, this big a difference or more extreme 51% of the time. We'd see this result, or more extreme result, we'd see an H greater than or equal to, where is it, this one, this is our H, 1.3, Four, four, fifty-one percent of the time. If the null was true, we'd see an age greater than or equal to 1.34, 51 percent of the time. Sorry, it's kind of hard to read. Any questions on that? You can see it's just not very unlikely, so we don't reject, you know. So now we'll take a deep breath and do the last for, last section, and we'll be done. It's just one page, and then we can do some eye clickers. These non-parametric tests I find really fun because uh, they're just very easy to understand and um, simple, and you don't need any assumptions, so they're really nice. And they're extremely useful, extremely useful. Okay, so especially if you have small samples. So let's do this one. All right, so this is the Spearman rank order correlation coefficient. And again, this is it's abbreviated R sub S instead of just R. And it's the non-parametric version of the regular correlation coefficient R. And it's computed exactly the same way, except 
uh, all the x and y values are first replaced with their ranks. So if you have a set of 10 points, 10 x, y values, you just replace them with the numbers 1 through 10 for both x and y, and um, then you compute the correlation coefficient on those numbers, which makes it extremely easy, and it makes, um, and you, there, it's going to be distribu distributed as a z statistic very quickly. Um, basically, for seven or more pairs, it's very close to a, a z distribution, and for smaller um, numbers, you use the exact probability distribution for both the H stat and this one. For all of them, the exact probability tables are computed for very small sample sizes. All right, so let's look at this. And so here, um, so that means all your, however, any, however, let's say for N X Y pairs, you'll have numbers X and Y values replaced with the numbers one, between one and N. So let's just imagine these. You have seven pairs of numbers. And instead of computing the correlation coefficient on these, you change them all for ranks. And I already put the x's in order from 1, see 27 is the smallest, the next smallest, etc., all the way up to the largest. So the ranks for the x's is 1, I already, it's already done for you, 2, I just put them in this order, 3, 80 is the fourth largest, then you go up to 86, okay? So if it wasn't done for you, you could just do it. Put them in order by the x's, it makes it easier. So here we have the x's, 1 through 7, and now I'm just going to um, convert these to ranks. So I have to find the smallest of the y's. And they start at 40, right? So isn't 40 the smallest of all the y values? Mm-hmm. And the next smallest is 45. What comes after 45? Is there any in the 50s? No. Here's one in the 60s. This must be the third, 61. Is this the fourth is 70, right? No. 79 is the fifth. And then, did I miss one? No, 79, 82 is the sixth, and the last one is 99, is the seventh. So now I have these, okay? I have these instead of these, and these are really easy to, to graph. You could even graph them if you wanted to see what it's gonna look like. They're just the numbers one through seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Just to see what it looks like. So we have one, two, two, one, three, four, four, three, five, seven, six, five, and seven, six. So it looks like they're going up. Doesn't it look like a very strong positive correlation? Doesn't it? It's very strong co positive correlation. But what is the positive correlation? So do you remember how to do a correlation coefficient? A correlation coefficient, as you probably remember, is what? It's the, first you have to take, the, you take the product of their z-scores, you change x and y to z, so you have zx times zy. You convert them to z-scores, a common measuring stick. Take their products. And then take the average of the products, so you sum them all up, and you divide by n. Okay? So let's do that. So that's what we're going to do. So we take the x's and we change them to z-scores. So we need to know the average for each of them. Now, this is why it's so easy. The average of the numbers, you can see, is 3.5, right? Um, I mean, 4. It's <laughs> 4. Duh. Right here, it's the average, n plus 1 over 2. So the average for here is 4, right? And the standard deviation of the x's I know is 2. I could work it out for you. It's very simple, but you're just going to take the deviations and square them. 
and then take the average and the square root. Does anybody want to see it worked out or not? Okay, so we've got that. Now the y's, so we have, what do we, let's put them in here. We have 1, 2, that's our first, 2, 1, 3, 4, 4, 3, 5, 7, 6, 5, and 7, 6. And of course, aren't these going to have this, they're the same numbers in different orders, so the y's also have to average a 4 and have to have the same de standard deviation. All right, so now when we convert them to z-scores, you just, the way, you, it's just the value 1 minus its average over the standard deviation, so it's negative 3 halves. And the next one would be 2 minus 4 over 2. So that's negative 1. The next one would be what? Negative 1 half. This is 0 deviation. It's right at there. This is 1 above. 1 above the average, and you have to divide by 2. This is 2 above the average, and this is 3 above the average. And now, when you add them all up, make sure they sum to what? The deviations, again, it's the same thing. The deviations, this deviation, all these deviations have to sum to 0. The deviations from the average. Okay? Just check that they do. And now we can do the same thing for the y's. So for the y's, 4, this one's going to be right at its average, so it's 0 above. This one is what? 2 minus 4 over 2, so that's negative 1. This is what? 1 minus 3. 1 minus 4, it's negative 3 over 2. Right? This one is negative 1 over 2. 7 is 3 over 2, 1 over 2, and this is 1. And again, they'll sum equal to 0. All right, so um, that's the deviations. So, and now we're just going to take the products of them. So we're going to say the product of those is 3 halves, 1.5. The product of these is also 1.5, 0. Product of that is zero. This is three fourths. This is one half. And this is one one point five. And now we'll add all these up. Add up all these products, and we get what? Three plus two is five point seven five, and divided by seven. And that is 0 0.84, very strong correlation coefficient. Make sure you get between negative 1 and 1. So it's a strong correlation. And here's our usual null, the population core. So we're taking from a much bigger population, you imagine, that has much bigger, let's say, um, Let's say if they were all positive, maybe, I don't know. Let's, well, they're going to be all ranks. So they're just going to, and it's a correlation coefficient of 0. That's the null in the population. So rho, you'd call it, but let's just say r population equals 0. So it looks like this, you know, rho for the Greek letter, r. And then we pick out seven points. And what's the probability that we pick out seven that go all in a line like that? That's what we're looking at. Okay? What's the probability that we would do that when the null is true? And that's the idea, that we'd get them so, such a high correlation. And the alternative is we didn't, it was going to be, we didn't have any, we didn't set any particular direction, so it will be two-sided. And now, the distribution of r under the null is approximately normal because of the numbers are just un uniform, dis uniformly distributed here. Uniform distribution just means one, to, look, the number is 1 through 7. 1, 2, in case you're not used to, 4, 5, 6, 7. They're just, you have one of each, uniform. And when it looks like that, the, when you, um, the numbers look like that, they're just, that's going to be very, that's a very simple distribution. 
where the central limit theorem kicks in extremely soon. And in the population, it's totally uniform. That's our sample. In the population, it's completely uniform, too. All right, so now, um, so we have our usual z, but we have this standard error, which is an easier formula because we know the standard deviations. Remember what our usual formula was? So it's easier than what we had before, where we had to use the approx we had to use n minus 2, and we had to do um, the standard error of r is equal to the square root of 1 minus r squared over um, the square root of n minus 2. Now this is a much easier standard error. OK, so now let's do it. So our observed is 0 0.84. And our expected under the null is 0, right there, and over 1 over the square root of what? 6. So that's our z statistic. It's very, very easy. And our z statistic is, this turns out to be about 2.05. So um, we'll mark it as a z and an r. This is 0 is both. So this is 1, 2, 3. And so between 2.05 and negative 2.05 is a z is um, what? Sorry. Um, 95.96, let's just round to 96%. So our z, our p-value, is both tails because why? Because it's an inequality whether we didn't specify a direction. And so um, as r, this is where 0 0.84 is as an r turns out to be two standard deviations above average, 2.05. And so the p-value is what? That's 2% here and 2% there. So our p is equal to, it's 100% minus 96%, which is equal to 4, both sides. And so our conclusion is we'll reject the null at alpha equals 0 0.05 at 5% and conclude there's strong evidence that R in the population is not equal to 0. We wouldn't be able to reject it at alpha equals 1%. It just depends on how, what alpha you choose. So any questions on that? It's much easier. These non-parametrics are easier than they're fun. Any questions? All right, so um, let me just show you. We can do some eye clickers. Let's do, so I, what I did here was I gave you some practice problems on non-parametric tests. We can look at some, we can go over some of these. Um, next time, there are also some of these, not all of them, but variations on these. And actually, questions 3 through 5, these on the Spearman correlation coefficient, are already posted as practice problems for the final. So you have practice problems for the final consisting of an actual final from, um, I think it's the semester before last, the actual final um, is up there. and. Um, then you also have uh, either these problems are very, very similar to these problems as randomized problems on, they're called practice problems on non-parametrics. And I can, we can go over, we have two days to go over the, to prepare for the final. So after you look at these and try them on your own, next time if you have any questions, I can post the solutions, and then next time, if you have any questions, we can go over them, and we can start 
uh, going over all the problems here because it's going to take us quite a while and just spend the next uh, two lectures that we have doing uh, the review in two parts. So um, I suggest you try this on your own first. Here, let's look at question four here because that's the one people give me have the most questions on. And I've changed it into an eye clicker. So let's do question four here and see what you think. It's going to be the same thing as in your notebook here. And let's just do it as an eye clicker. And then, um, so. Our S um, is the rank is the correlation coefficient once you change them to ranks, and R is our ordinary correlation coefficient. So this is A, B, C, D. Whoa. You can only do E, right, on your eye clicker? Oh, what can you conclude about R and R? Oh, yeah, one, two, three, four. Yeah, sorry. This is A, B, C, D, and E. Yeah, sorry I didn't put that there. A, B, C, D, and E. Okay, did everybody make a choice? And no, you, you want to think about it a little more? You can talk to each other about it. We just, huge hint, huge hint. We just did a problem that um, where we converted to, the, they both were numbers, one through seven, and they both had the same averages and the same standard deviations. You had a set of numbers that, did they have this huge hint? We just did a. When you convert to ranks, they're always going to have the same average and the same standard deviations. Because they're going to be the same numbers, 1 through n for both of them. OK, so now is a huge hint. And let's, what did you say? So let's look what you said. That R is equal to RS. I should stop it before you change your mind. That's, you're all just changing to the wrong answer. <laughs> you're changing to the wrong answer. Think about it. Okay. So, let's look. Oops. The right answer is none of the above. Why? Let's just go. I clearly have to explain this better. Okay. Document camera. First of all, they all have the same averages and the same standard deviations. Look. We just did first. Okay. Once they're converted, they're always going to have the same averages and the same standard deviations because they're going to be the same numbers in different order. So we didn't get a chorus so you, that. But these, do you really think these are going to have the same correlation coefficient as those? No, there's lots of different. Look, I could change, for example, I could change 94 to 9,000, 9, 400,000, whatever, and it would still have rank 7. That's going to be, but it's going to change the regular correlation coefficient completely. I could change 27 to negative 5 billion, and it would still have, that's going to change the correlation coefficient completely, but it would still have the same rankings. Does that help? It matters how, correlation is all about how they're paired up. Here we have two sets of numbers. All you know is that they're in this square. 
you don't know if they slant this way, this way, any old way. Because these numbers are going to have the same average and the same. Correlation is about how they are paired with each other. So knowing their averages and standard, once you change to z-scores, they always have the same average and standard deviations. Once you change to z-scores, so what does it tell you? Once you change them to z-scores, they're going to have an average of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. So what are we doing? We're putting them all on a common scale, right? We put them in a common scale. And then we're trying to see, what do we know? The average tells us the middle of the cloud in both directions. And the standard devi deviation tells us the spread. So you know the box they're in, but you don't know anything about how they're paired up. Does that make sense? That's all you know. That's why you need the five statistics. You don't just need the averages and the standard deviation. You need the correlation coefficient to see the relationship between the two. So what's the next question? Let's go over here. So now we'll go to the... Okay, so the next one is this. Remember, when you compute any kind of correlation coefficient, you're changing them to z-scores anyways. You're normalizing both sets. Otherwise, you can't compare. It's like height and weight. How could you compare height and weight? You have to have a standard measuring stick. You always change to z-scores. But they're not necessarily normally distributed. They're z-scores. Now you're saying that they're normally distributed as well. Would that really make a difference? When you change the z-scores, they don't necessarily have to be normally distributed. But now you're also adding the assumption that they're normally distributed. All right, let's stop it and see what you say. It's none of the above. I hope you answered that. Oh, no. Okay. All right. This is a hard concept, I guess. It really is. It sounds like it should be the same. Okay, it's none of the above. Because, again... You need to know how they're paired up. Maybe if you did the next one, you'll understand this. So let's just go to the next one. And here, we're going to look at this one. So now we're not in normal distributions anymore. We're back at any distribution. And now we're adding this extra piece of information. The same student was a top score on both exams. The same student was a second top score. This is, I guess these are kind of difficult questions. But you'll think. Um, Okay, I'm going to stop it, and let's see what you answered. This one, now you know the rank spear is 1. You do know this, because you know the rankings match up. Once you know this, you know the rankings match up, right? If I also said they were normally distributed, then the percentiles would all match up, and the, the, you could say... Both these things are true. But here you can only say this one's true. You know the rankings are messed up, but are, are matched up. So let's just show you that. The rankings are matched up. But that doesn't necessarily mean um, that the, the regular correlation coefficient is also going to pay attention to the values themselves. 
values themselves. So it's going to distinguish between somebody who like did phenomenal on the not just the top score, but how the spacings, how far he was from the average. And so, uh, yeah, so that's kind of a difficult, I guess that's a little bit of a difficult question. All right, so think about these. And um, if you have any questions about, or if you want to see how, where that 12 came from, in the, uh, if you're mystified by that, I can explain that uh, for the standard error, or, uh, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>